Welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the brightest minds from the stock market, uncovering their secrets to success. If you're looking for ideas, tips and techniques from the world's best, you're in the right place. Today, I was hugely lucky to speak to Perth Toll, founder of Life and Liberty Indexes. First of all, Perth spoke to us from Houston, Texas, an area recently hit by Hurricane Laura. Luckily, Houston avoided any severe impact, but unfortunately the weather did play havoc with Perth's internet connection, which does mean some of the interview's audio isn't quite as clear as usual. But after a Herculean effort from our editors, I really hope you enjoy the episode. And for a quick intro, having worked as a private banker for one of the biggest asset managers in the world, Fidelity Investments, 10 years later Perth decided to found her own firm in 2014. Life and Liberty Indexes is a purveyor of indices and ETFs designed to produce long-term outperformance in emerging markets, while observing the freedom and human rights of the subjects within those nations. Often quoted throughout financial media, including numerous Bloomberg interviews, Perth was named one of the 10 to watch in 2020 by Wealth Management magazine. If you're serious about the impact your investments have on the world, this isn't one to miss. Hello and welcome, Perth. Great to have you on the podcast. How's your week been so far? It's great to be here. Um, week's been great. Thanks for having me. No, no worries at all. Um, so before we dig into your background, I want to start with a couple of questions to better understand the work you do at Life and Liberty Indexes. So first, what is a freedom-weighted equity index? Yeah, so a freedom-weighted index is basically using personal and economic freedom metrics to weight and select countries um, instead of using a market capitalization approach, which uh, uses a, um, you know, the size of the market. So instead of ending up, especially in emerging markets, this is important because emerging markets, there's so many um, autocracies or countries just coming out of autocracies. Um, with a market capitalization weighted approach, you get a lot of allocations and concentrations in autocratic countries. Um, and that's typically not what the average investor is looking to do. Um, so we try to solve that by freedom weighting instead. And so we end up with higher weights in the freer markets, lower weights in the less free markets, and the worst offenders as far as personal and economic freedoms are excluded altogether. Yeah, interesting. So obviously cynics will contest that perhaps similar in a way to ESG funds, these products are there to appeal to investors' sensibilities. So firstly, how do you answer those critics? Yeah, so there is a lot of cynicism around ESG these days, and I think a lot of that is very valid. Um, just looking at emerging markets ESG, um, you know, iShares or um, some of the other bigger ones, they have, if you look at emerging markets, they have 40% in China, and then further percentages in Saudi Arabia, Russia, Egypt, and Turkey. So these are some very unfree regimes at the moment, uh, but they make up more than 50% of an emerging market's ESG strategy. So I think that ESG does have a long way to go in, especially in markets where, you know, the data is just not transparent and it's not reliable. Um, it's not available for everyone. So not only is the ESG data um, that we're using for those type of strategies probably not robust, but also there is absolutely no consideration for country level ESG. So um, this is more of a country level macro top down approach. Um, and that's because we believe that, you know, um, governments are best positioned to protect personal and economic freedoms versus the companies themselves. Yeah. So I guess that differentiated strategy to your typical ESG strategy, does that offer kind of retail investors or, or investors all over the world, I suppose, long term outperformance? Can, can indices weighted in this way provide true outperformance, in your opinion? Yeah. So I think historically speaking, the freer markets have always been the outperformers in the long run, but that's a very long run. So we're looking at history here. Um, in the short term, no one's going to know what's going to happen. Um, what ESG strategies and also a strategy like this does as a behavior hack for investors is that if you're invested in something that you truly believe in and that you have a deep conviction about, um, something like freedom, then you're going to be more likely to stick to it when times are bad. And we did see that get tested this year. So um, earlier this year, when we had the crash you know, in the first quarter, we did not see any redemptions from this fund. So sticking to it is what 
I think in the end will cause that better outcome for investors more than any of these other, you know, other factors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And we'll return to uh, performance and kind of a deeper detail about uh, how the portfolio is constructed or how the index is constructed, I should say, later on in the episode. But as I mentioned at the start of the call, uh, I wanted to dig into your background a bit and just get a better understanding of how you've made it to where you are today. So firstly, after studying finance and marketing at university, you worked at Fidelity for around 10 years, I believe. So can you tell our listeners a bit about your role there? Yeah, so I was at Fidelity as a, a personal financial advisor. So I believe on your side of the pond, you call this a personal banker or something, a private banker. So I basically worked with families and individuals um, to plan and uh, invest their assets. And I did have a lot of clients. I, I worked mostly in, client, in California and Texas, where I did have a lot of clients who were not um, native to, you know, they were, they were immigrants to America from other places like China, like Russia, like the Middle East here in Houston, especially, who felt the same way that I did, where we didn't want to invest in our home countries because of these freedom issues, but, you know, still wanted the emerging markets exposure. So that kind of helped open my eyes to, you know, there, there should be an option out there for investors like this. So, um, so yeah, I was there basically as a financial advisor for all those years. And, and I loved, um, I loved being there and doing that. Yeah. So then uh, you've talked about a few experiences that I guess were formative in uh, your inception of the current business that you're now CEO and founder of Life and Liberty Indexes. That was founded in 2014, I believe. So firstly, if you could sum up the company's mission statement, uh, your kind of purpose for being, I suppose, what would it be? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of power um, in being in position to direct assets. So whether you're a financial advisor or whether you're a personal investor, what you do in the market matters. And especially in emerging markets where there's a, a clear uh, you know, there's no neutral in emerging markets. There's either you're supporting freedom or you're supporting autocracies and oppression. So um, I think our mission is to direct investments toward the freer countries and provide a way for investors who believe in the long-term benefits of freedom um, to be able to express that in their investment allocations. Yeah, interesting. So uh, if I can just touch on those experiences that I suppose when you're at F uh, Fidelity and earlier on in your career that uh, inspired you to create these products, this business. You lived in China and Hong Kong, I believe, uh, having done a bit of research before the call. So were those also experiences and life experiences that proved fairly formative in uh, getting this company and these products to market? Yes, absolutely. So I grew up in both China and the U.S. I was born in Beijing and I lived there until I was about nine years old. And then I lived in the U.S. after that. Um, so, you know, going back and forth. And so I saw the huge difference that freedom made um, in my life. Um, if I had never come to the U.S., things would be very different. Um, and then I went back to Hong Kong after college and lived there for a while. Um, and there Again, I saw the difference that Frida made in these markets, the markets in Hong Kong versus China versus the U.S. And I saw that, that you know, governance, policies, these things have an impact. And uh, one of the things that really hit home for me is I'm part of the one child generation. So we grew up under the one child policy. And the, there's the statistics like, you know, there's 30 million missing women in China based on official Chinese government statistics. Um, some estimates have it as high as 60 million. So I saw how this policy changed the entire um, culture of my generation, besides the whole wiping out future generations part of it. Um, it, it just changed the, the entire culture of my, my generation. So in our investments, we should support policies that promote um, you know, individual rights and freedoms and, uh, and not go to support autocracies. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I wanted to go back to uh, your time at Fidelity and just to get an, a, an understanding of working for a large corporation such as such as Fidelity, obviously they've got something like $3 trillion AUM. You go from that after working there, 
over a decade, as I said, to running your own business uh, starting in 2014. So what was what was the sort of change in mindset, the change in culture there? You know, how, how have you found that transition? That transition was not easy. It was very difficult. And having your own business, it's like you have to make those grooves yourself, kind of, you know, like, whereas if you work for a large corporation, they're, they're already there um, so so yeah it was definitely a challenge um, but it was a fun challenge and I, I remember um, from very early on I had a lot of encouragement from um, people that I looked up to in the industry I didn't know many people but I did reach out to a couple and um, they were very encouraging yeah definitely and it might be an unfair question but I'll ask it anyway which do you prefer do you prefer working for the big corporation or now running your own business <laughs> Um, I think my personality is more suited to working for a big company, actually. Um, it, it's a lot of work and a lot of responsibility to be um, doing everything yourself. So um, I do enjoy this immensely, though. I think it has to do with different seasons in life. And um, at some point, I may go back to working for a big company. Um, at this point, it's hard to imagine having been on my own this long. I think most entrepreneurs can relate to that. Um, Probably when I retire, I'll like, teach or something. I don't know, but <laughs> but I do miss the uh, the team aspect. I am fortunate in that I did end up, you know, teaming up with some great partners. So it's I never feel alone in this endeavor. Um, but I do really enjoy the being a part of a big team aspect. Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, okay, well, I think that's probably done a good job of covering your background and kind of how you've come to create. Uh, this firm and this product offering so uh, i want to get into the latter now uh, life and liberty indexes um, i'm keen to give our audience a more in-depth understanding of them uh, and particularly the freedom 100 emerging markets index uh, but first of all what factors are you looking to screen for or exclude in life and liberty's freedom weighted indices yeah, so we are looking to screen for, on the country level, freedom only, and that means personal and economic freedoms. We divide that into three categories, the rights to life, the rights to liberty, and the rights to property. Rights to liberty are things like terrorism, trafficking, internal organized conflict, um, like ongoing wars in the country and so forth. Also includes uh, women's freedoms, so we have five women's freedom proxies. Um, such, such as missing women, um, women's inheritance rights, FGM, uh, and so forth. Um, rights to liberty are things like rule of law, due process, plurality of um, political parties, government uh, accountability, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of the media, um, freedom of religion, and so forth. And the last is rights to liberty, which are your economic freedoms. So these are things like taxation, um, private property rights, business regulation, the size of government, um, and soundness of monetary policy. Overall, there's 76 different variables that are evaluated by our third-party think tank um, partners, and uh, we use data from the Cato Institute, the Fraser Institute, and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation over there, closer to you, in Germany. They have a joint project called the Human Freedom Index and Dataset, um, where they compile these 76 different metrics. And I just take the composite country score. So I don't go in and cherry pick you know, which specific you know, variables are more important than others. I just take the composite score. And that gives me that third party objectivity. So how we came to work with these guys is you know, in the very beginning, there weren't many sources for quantifying human freedoms. There were you know, for economic freedoms, but not for the personal side. Um, so we actually developed our own way of quantifying human freedoms. And I had a, a provisional patent on that. Um, when I left Fidelity and I went um, to score the countries using our system, um, the Fraser Institute was one of our sources um, for economic freedom. So I went to their website and I saw that they, at that time, now had a human freedom index and data set. So I called my contact over there. We compared notes and our systems were almost identical. And so I asked for permission to use theirs instead of my own. And that saves me about you know, four months out of the year scoring and also gives me complete objectivity because we operate independently from them and they operate independently from us. So there's no way I could, you know, game the system or arbitrarily exclude or include any country. Yeah, interesting. So, and it, as you say, it's very much a, a top-down approach uh, in this index rather than, you know, bottom-up stock picking in line with a certain set of uh, investment principles. 
Yes, absolutely. So we do first look at the, the country selection and, and weights, and it's a very top-down macro approach. Once we have the country weights, then we do go in and, and select securities. And we're just trying to get a very um, good representation of the market in each of those included countries. So we take the 10 largest, most liquid companies within each country, excluding state-owned enterprises. Um, in some of the countries like Poland, you'll get a lot of exclusions because of the um, you know, state-owned banks and uh, the companies they have there. Um, in some countries, it makes very little difference when you exclude state-owned companies. But um, that's just to bring the economic freedom theme all the way through. Yeah, and then uh, kind of within that country data set, I suppose, there's 26 emerging markets, uh, as far as I can tell. And then 10 are actually considered in the formation of your index. So of those 10, uh, which typically received the greatest weighting? Yeah, so the, the top weighting right now, it, is, uh, it goes to, to Taiwan and uh, South Korea. And then next to, to them is, is Poland and Chile. So actually, I believe Chile is now ahead of Poland. So Poland used to be number one in this index. The index has been live for about three years. Um, the ETF has been live for about a year and uh, several months. But right now, Taiwan is the top country holding, followed by South Korea. Yeah, and within uh, the index, I believe 100 or, or so equities are held. Does that number fluctuate at all? Uh, yes. So the reason why there's 100 stocks in the index right now is because there are 10 countries and there's 10 securities per country. Um, it always has had 10 countries in the, in the history of the, the life history of the index, uh, but it's not capped at 10 countries. So sometimes you can have 11, sometimes you can have 12, sometimes you can have nine. We just haven't had that yet in the past three years. So we did name it the Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index because of that, um, but it is not capped, so uh, country-wise. So there could, you know, some years have 110 or 120 or 90 um, securities in the index, depending on what happens with the algorithm. Uh, we do have a cap on the security level, uh, but that's just the security level. So that's, we cap the securities at 8%. Okay, so it's obviously far more targeted than uh, something like the MSCI uh, EM index, for example, because uh, that covers well over a thousand equities. So, so why a hundred? Why why did you come? Why why did you decide that it was going to be ten countries or ten per country? A couple of reasons. One is I always designed this index to be the basis of an ETF, and ETFs, especially new ones, um, have to be very liquid. Uh, so, so that there's never any problems for anyone wanting to come in or out. Um, so the, the, the underlying liquidity of, of our product is actually higher than a lot of the, the biggest emerging markets funds out there. Um, I do believe it's higher than VWO, which is the Vanguard Emerging Markets uh, Index Fund. Yeah, completely. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. How are the respective weightings of the selected equities decided? I mean, which key metrics are considered to establish the value and the size of each holding? Yeah, so the the holdings, the equity holdings are very simple. The, they are actually market capitalization weighted. So the the we're again just trying to get a good representation of the market in that particular country. Um, the only exception we make to that is the capping that is done. Um, and the two companies that always get capped are Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung. So um, so because and that's because they're such a big part of those markets if you don't cap them they make up about 25 percent of each of, of their respective markets yeah interesting and I've, we've kind of covered it already but i just want to get a bit more clarity on this idea that freedom uh, as a principle is not something that's easily quantifiable so how did you go about creating a set of principles and then latterly a set of quantitative metrics to actually screen for these companies and, and to do that at scale yeah, so again, we do use the, the data from the Fraser Institute, the Cato Institute, and the Friedrich Nauman Foundation. So we're not using our own data. But when, when we did use our own data, you know, when I first created this in the past, and this is before it was a, it was a live product, um, how I did that is I took basically quantitative sources and turned them into qualitative data. 
So we briefly referenced Chinese stocks earlier on in the interview. They're excluded from your fund, I believe. So they would ordinarily account for a significant amount of gains in more traditional emerging market indices and represent um, about a third or even 40% of the MSCI EM index at the moment. So how does your product attempt to compensate for that? Yeah, I think actually that is a myth. So if you look at the last 10 years in um, the Shanghai Composite Index, and my friend um, wrote an article on this that was quite good. I can send it to you after. Um, but if you look at the last 10 years of the Shanghai Composite Index, it's basically been flat. But we know that there was tremendous growth in China in the last decade. Um, so why is that the case? And the reason for that is that when you're investing in unfree markets, you don't have the investor protections and rule of law in place to protect you as a foreign investor. Um, not only can a, a, a government sometimes privatize the entire company and your entire, you know, your entire investment is gone at that point, um, or there, there also tends to be a lot of fraud in these types of markets. We've seen that recently with Luckin and Coffee, for example. Um, but also, the the gains in the in the growth gets siphoned off to um, state actors or whoever they want it to go to. So it doesn't necessarily benefit the foreign investor to be invested in these markets if you want to take part in the growth of a country. Um, those investor protections and rule of law are extremely important um, as a foreign investor in emerging markets. So, um, so, so the, actually, China's market has dragged down the overall emerging markets index in the last 10 years. Um, if you look at, for example, Taiwan or South Korea, surrounding markets, also classified as emerging by most um, you know, investors, those you have seen a lot more growth in the in those past 10 years, even though China has realistically um, seen a lot of progress on the ground. But you, you, did, you did not see that in the stock market. So recently, though, this year, since coronavirus, they have strongly outperformed. So you are right about that. And um, as a result, we have underperformed the overall uh, benchmarks that have, that have like 40 percent in China. So that is something that will happen um, for investors in the in the freedom weighted strategy is that when China outperforms that we will underperform because we don't have that huge allocation to China. So that is the biggest source of um, tracking error in this type of strategy. Um, however, you know, we do believe that freer markets are more sustainable in their growth. So the growth doesn't come from directives from the government, um, but it comes from is powered by the people. So. Um, and we do believe that's a better way of, of growing a market. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it, it would be interesting to read that article as well. So m maybe if we can get that, we can try and put a link to it uh, in, in the episode sure. as well. It's actually um, on the freedometfs.com website under news. It's an article by Dr. Jin Choi. Um, right. So that, uh, yeah. But I'll send it to you as well. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we've talked a lot about the structure of the index and the ETF, but uh, I wanted to give our audience a flavor of the companies that make it into this index. So perhaps you could highlight a couple of the more interesting firms that you've got currently in the index right now. Yeah, so some of the firms that we have in there, um, I'll just talk about the top three. So we have Taiwan Semiconductor, Samsung, and a company in Poland called CD Project. Um, all of these are... are technology related. So the, the top two, they're obviously chip manufacturers who have kind of become a zeitgeist for the times um, in this capital and technology war that is going on between the US and China. So these companies um, no longer supply to Huawei, for example, but instead have become uh, very important strategically for even the US and, uh, and Europe and other markets who can no longer work with Huawei and possibly some of these other Chinese technology companies. So, um, so they are set to benefit from the decoupling that's going on um, between the U.S. and China. Um, and then the third company, uh, CD Projekt, is a video game developer in Poland. Um, they have done extremely well over the you know recent past. If you look at their chart, it, it makes Amazon look like a treasuries, is what my friend Will Hershey likes to say. 
Um, so, uh, so he's kind of a gamer. So, and he has a gaming index. So he's got the same holding in his index. But, um, but obviously, that's set to capture the the trend in uh, video games and the growth there, um, with everyone staying home for quarantine. Um, which you know, esports and video games is, is an area of growth that was already happening before virus is just being accelerated now. Um, and that's what we see with a lot of these trends, that this decoupling of supply chains and um, kind of this diversification of uh, trade has been happening before coronavirus, um, but it is set to accelerate as a result of it. And uh, a lot of these freer markets that are smaller in Asia uh, and elsewhere, you know, markets like India, Mexico as well, are set to, to benefit from these trends. Yeah, interesting. So we've talked about the companies that are typically in there. We've talked about the top three. Um, what sort of companies will always be excluded from freedom-weighted indices? So you mentioned state-owned enterprises earlier, but there, are there any other segments of the market that would never be included in an index like this? Yeah, no. Other than the state-owned enterprises, there are no... Oh, uh, actually, I take that back. So state-owned enterprises will always be excluded. And the only other comp- type of company that will be excluded is uh, majority holding companies. And we define that as a company that has 80% or more of its um, assets and uh, kind of market cap in the assets of another company that is in an excluded country. So, um, and, and I did get a lot of flack about this earlier because this rule wasn't in place when we first launched the index. So we ended up with a company called Naspers uh, which is a South African media company who invested in Tencent early on. Now that Tencent investment did extremely well for them, um, and I do believe that we had every you know right to have that company in there because it's, it is a South African company that is subject to South African laws, um, and they have the right to invest in who they want, whether or not we agree with them. Um, and that investment did very well for them, but it did so well that now Tencent is the entire market cap of Naspers. Um, it became such a problem on the you know, exchange that they had to spin off a part of their companies to, to Amsterdam exchange, and, uh, and, th- and that comp- company is called Prostis. So you'll see in some of these big emerging markets funds, Tencent, Naspers, and Prostis in the top 10 holdings, and those are all three essentially the same company. So, you know, that was... That was um, legitimate criticism that we received in the beginning about this kind of issue. If a company is entirely made up of another company in a country that is excluded, then perhaps that is not in the spirit of what we're trying to do. Um, I did consult with some um, investors and they said, no, we don't have a problem with that. And then I did consult with some human rights activists and they said, we absolutely have a problem with that um, because you know those, we are investing in those you know, mass surveillance technology. Um, so, so, you know, based on that feedback, we did add a rule in the second year of rebalancing that, you know, holding companies with more than 80% of their assets in another company are excluded. Yeah. It's interesting to know that's, I guess, where you draw the line because ultimately I guess you're never going to be completely rid of investments on behalf of the constituents that you aren't completely on board, but when kind of a, a section business gets made into its uh, its own holding company then that i guess yeah that's your line uh, and and that makes complete sort of logical sense to me anyway if i can talk to you about the opportunity here i mean we've got a lot of retail investors that will be listening in uh, and they want to understand firstly how they can invest and trade your product uh, so can you talk to us about that um, the, the etf i suppose is is the way to get exposure to to this index so the ETF is tracking the index, and, and the, the ticker for the ETF is FRDM, uh, short for freedom. So um, same ticker as the, the index itself. So, so that is the, the way to access um, the strategy. We don't currently actively market in Europe, um, but uh, I believe it is available for investors who have access to U.S. stocks and funds in their brokerage accounts. Yes. Okay. Um, and then how's the index performing? Firstly, year to date, I imagine not uh, kind of amazingly well, given the, the, the reasons that you gave about China earlier, but then perhaps you can give me performance uh, since inception. 
Yeah, so um, so it did it did underperform the index or the the benchmarks this year that have a lot of China in it, as we mentioned before, um, until the recovery. So during the recovery, we have outperformed um, the the benchmarks that have a, a high allocation to China. Um, that's despite you know the Chinese government taking out a, a full page ad in the Securities Times. Um, which is a division of their, you know, the, the China Daily, their paper, um, which is like a state uh, mouthpiece, um, saying that everyone should buy stocks. I believe on that day, U.S. Um, ETFs, such as A-share ETFs, went up like 11% on one day. It was a Monday. Um, in this case, the reason why that happened is because during the drawdown, the freer markets were more transparent in letting information flow through their markets than the unfree ones. So they did get a little bit undersold in my opinion. Yeah, okay, so if I'm invested in this index or in this ETF, what longer term themes or mega trends am I exposed to by investing in a, in a freedom weighted index like this? Yeah, so one of the things that we've seen in freer markets is that there's a higher percentage currently to uh, the technology sector. So we see that here in the chip manufacturing sector, especially with Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung, and uh, also smaller companies like MediaTek and, uh, well, not too small, but smaller than, than you know, Taiwan Semi. Um, there's also uh, Foxconn. So these companies that make the chips for our you know, computers and our iPhones um, are going to be benefiting from the protection from, you know, Western countries um, as the decoupling continues between US and China. So the decoupling, which is unfortunate, um, does benefit some of these other players in the more freer, in the freer markets um, who are in these types of industries. Um, and, and we are incentivized as uh, the free world to kind of continue to support those, those types of companies because they are supplying an essential part of our, you know, everyday lives. Um, and as, as we, you know, are banned from doing business with uh, Huawei and other um, Chinese entities, these companies are set to capture that, um, that business going forward. I think, though, one thing that we, we do want to say that is that we, we do encourage free trade as kind of freedom investors, and we give countries that have free trade a higher score in our index. However, you know, this is a special time where there have been some um, unfair trade practices going on, some lack of investor protections, lack of intellectual property. Um, so in those types of instances, you know, we are here to promote, you know, the, the more freer, but also fairer types of trade practices. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can imagine it's extremely gratifying too. Okay, well, I think that's the perfect place to end the interview. Thanks so much for your time, Perth. It's been great to have you on the podcast and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest to you. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during a trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new podcasts, stock reports or events from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. Until next time.